I'm Dustin Abbott, and I'm here today to uh, take a first look and to break down the kind of build and the feature set of the Canon EOS 5DS-R. Now, Canon, uh, when it released the 5DS and the 5DS-R um, about seven months ago, um, it released for kind of for the first time at the releasing a kind of a two-purpose or two-tier um, camera choice in that the a 5DS has the traditional high-pass uh, filter that helps to um, eliminate things like more and kind of more of a general purpose, while the a 5DS-R cancels that high-pass filter and thus allows for maximum sharpness and resolution at the cost of perhaps introducing more more in different kinds of situations. This is a choice that Nikon shooters have had in the past with, with the uh, similar variation between the Nikon D800 and then the D800E um, that also could have the, the canceled high pass filter. So anyway, the, of course the big selling feature for the 5DSR is the fact that it is essentially the 5D Mark III when it comes to the overall body and structure. And of course, the advantage of that is that the 5DS or 5DSR, it can uh, share a lot of accessories with the uh, F Canon 5D Mark III. So that's an advantage for uh, a number of reasons. On top of that, of course, for those that are familiar with shooting a 5D Mark III, you're going to find the overall placement and handling to be very, very similar. Um, there are some internal changes and one of the kind of the significant uh, structural changes to the camera is really more about reinforcing the bottom plate area. The reason for this is that, of course, the primary reason for the 5DS and 5DSR's existence is making a huge jump from the 5D Mark III's 22 megapixel sensor to a 50 plus megapixel sensor that is in these bad boys. So as a result, one of the downsides of having so many pixels is that uh, cameras like this become much more punishing of things like motion blur. And so as a result, some of the, the feature upgrades in the actual physical body of this camera, like all these reinforcement of the tripod mount plate here, is all about about making sure that you can get the maximum amount of stability for the camera to help to eliminate that issue. And so as a result, there is a reinforced bottom plate here at the tripod mount, and then some pretty significant improvements that have been made to the actual action of the, uh, the shutter and the movement of the mirror, and even some choices for a mirror lockup that are all designed around eliminating vibration and movement within the camera. Somehow, Canon has managed to shave a few ounces off of this, and so um, the 5DSR weighs in at 29.81 ounces. That's 845 grams, while the 5D Mark III is just slightly heavier at 30.24 ounces, or 860 grams. And so, are you going to feel that difference in the field? Very likely not, unless you have extremely sensitive hands. Of course, it, they all are a bit heavier than um, I've done a lot of shooting with the Canon 60, and I have a couple of these bodies, and the 60 is considerably lighter at 27.16 ounces or 770 grams. And so enough that you can tell a difference in the weight. It's not huge, um, but you can tell a bit of a difference. And of course, the overall build is a little bit chunkier. And so if you have really small hands, you may find the grip on the 5DSR to be um, a little bit bigger a stretch than what you're accustomed to. That being said, I had my wife um, grab it. She's had, she has quite small hands. And, and I, I asked her how it felt, and she said that it felt fine to her. And of course, if you have um, you know hands like my size, there's no problem there at all. Like the 6D, I find that the overall grip design, this is a strength for Canon. They really design very nice grips that kind of just naturally fit in the hand, and everything kind of falls to the right place. And so structurally, it is very nicely designed. And of course, one of the, the great advantages of the the 5D series that is lacking on the 6D or bodies like the 70 or 80D is, of course, the inclusion of this thumbstick, which can be used for a variety of purposes and generally makes life simpler, particularly when it comes to selecting autofocus points. The um, 
5DSR has basically inherited the 5D Mark III's very excellent focus system. It's ironic to me that there are those that have been critical of the 5DSR or 5DS's focus system when, of course, the 5D Mark III's focus system has been widely praised since its introduction about four or five years ago. And it really has been an excellent camera that is, has performed very, very well for Canon. I'm reviewing the 5DSR kind of at this point in uh, kind of in preparation for the soon arrival in the fall of the 5D Mark IV. And so I can then report a little more accurately um, comparing the strengths and weaknesses of the two camera bodies. I'm also about to start a review of the Zeiss Otis 28mm f1.4 lens which of course is an incredibly high resolving lens and so I wanted to mate it with an incredibly high resolving camera body. So uh, it, as far as the overall upgrades, the big upgrade of course is that huge sensor. And so let's look at what other upgrades are here to account for the additional. Right now it's about a thousand dollar difference between the 5D Mark III, which of course is very close to the end of its kind of current cycle, um, and then the 5DS. Uh, so you're, you're paying a, a fair bit of money. So of course the big upgrade is 50 megapixels which for some people is going to be, that's all that it takes right there. But as I've noted, there is a specially tuned uh, mirror that will help reduce mirror slap and limits vibration. Like the 70 Mark II, it inherited that new feature of having flicker detection. And so if you are an event shooter, in fact, I just shot an event uh, using the 5 DSR as one of the cameras uh, for that last night where it was in a school auditorium and of course like sodium lights that cycle and the flicker detection really helps to synchronize your shooting and so that you get consistent um, white balance and consistent exposure and so it's really quite a nice feature for those that um, shoot in event type settings. And of course, this for a lot of people is a camera that a lot of wedding photographers um, have considered. It also adds on a built-in intervalometer and so you can shoot time lapses. And it also adds the feature where you can um, create a movie in camera. It has a built-in bulb timer, which is a, a very logical feature that really earlier Canon should have already had, but I'm glad that finally we're getting these kind of features um, in there. It also enables you to have a crop shooting mode. Of course, with that massive amount of megapixels, there's a lot of cropping ability there anyway. And so it actually has a couple of modes where you can choose to shoot an APS-H that's a 1.3 times crop, and that's at 30.5 megapixels, which of course is still a ton. Um, and then you can also shoot an APS-C with the 1.6 times crop mode and still have nearly 20 megapixels, 19.6, which is a lot of pixels to um, put on the subject. And you're basically pretty much matching what the 70D is capable of doing, even with that crop mode. So still plenty of resolution. That really sounded exciting to me. Um, in practice, it's not quite as exciting because rather than actually showing, say, the crop in the, the actual viewfinder, instead you get either a masking or a box around the area that's being cropped. And so you don't actually get drawn closer to the action. Now, if you shoot in live view, um, you, you are cropped in, um, but it's kind of interesting to me that when you go to review images, uh, it still shows the full frame and then either that bit of mask or the boxing showing where the actual crop is. Once you actually download your photos, um, they, will, they will be cropped, of course. But kind of the way that it plays out uh, makes it a little bit less exciting to me. It may help you in framing, but I, I'm frankly not seeing a lot of advantages there that you couldn't do in cropping afterward. And of course, being able to crop in a massive way is one of the reasons why um, wildlife photographers are interested in this camera despite the fact that it only has five frame per second which drops one down from the 5D Mark III. Of course, the ability, the fact that it's able to move um, 50 megapixels of data at five frames per second is really, it's pretty good, all things considered. And for your applications, depending on what you shoot, it may be enough. Obviously, it's not anywhere near to matching what either the 7D Mark II or even better, the 1DX Mark II, what they're able to accomplish when it comes to that. One other thing I do want to mention that you might have a question about is the answer is can you, because it has a crop mode, can you mount APS-C um, or EFS mount lenses to this camera? The answer is still no, at least if it's a Canon EFS mount. It still has a unique uh, mount that uh, it, just, it just doesn't fit on there. 
Now, third-party crop sensor lenses from Sigma or Tamron, etc., they will actually fit on there because their physical bayonet mount is actually an EF, not an EFS mount. And, and so they will physically fit on, the, fit on the camera and you can shoot them in that crop mode. But your EFS lenses are not going to work. They still won't mount in, in that regard. One other thing, a uh, new feature is that Canon has implemented an, um, an AF servo focus mode during video recording. Uh, but the camera doesn't have anything like, you know, Canon's dual pixel AF, um, which makes, you know, I'm filming today on the Canon 80D. And of course that DPAF makes for fantastic um, servo tracking in video mode. Uh, you won't find that the AF servo movie mode is nearly as sophisticated on the 5DSR, but of course it's better than nothing. And cer so certainly nice to, to have that. So overall, as I am going along here, I'll be sharing images that I'm taking with it. And really what I'm, I'm trying to get at the most in here is that as a photographer, and I do a lot of things. I, I shoot a lot of professional work. I do product photography. I obviously do, I do weddings. I do landscapes. I do commercial work. Um, and then of course I, I shoot for pleasure as well. So the question I really want to answer is, is 50.2 megapixels necessary? Um, and are the trade-offs that come, I mean, the massive low when it comes to, uh, you know, moving information on your computer or, you know, the, cho the chance of introducing more motion blur um, because of those extreme amount of megapixels, is it really necessary for the average shooter? That's the question I hope to give you a really definitive answer on and enough information on this particular camera that when the 5D Mark, II, Mark IV comes out, you can make a choice as to whether this is the camera for you or the 5D Mark IV or or perhaps even the existing 5D Mark III, which remains a very capable camera and has a 22 um, megapixel sensor on it. I'm Dustin Abbott, and if you'll look down below, there is linkage to the ongoing image gallery, which I'll be adding to, and so you can check that link on a regular basis. There's also a link there if you would like to shop for the camera or to follow me on social media. Thanks for watching, and if you haven't already, please subscribe. Have a great day.